Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in. As we know, this is a tumultuous and an easy time for Clarkson College students, employees, and frankly the public as we enter this time of COVID-19 pandemic. For many reasons, we have prepared this video for you, for resources and information that's out there, as well as to remind you that we are healthcare and to encourage everyone to take a breath and know that we will get through this together and ask everyone to do their part. I'm Dr. Michael Witt, Associate Professor of Health and Wellness Coordinator at Clarkson College. And with me, we have Ms. Sharon Eden as Associate Professor of Microbiology and also teaching in Microbiology, Epidemiology, Environmental Risk Factors of Disease. Welcome. Thank you, Michael. As a quick disclaimer, this is, video is for informational and resource purposes. So for questions about your personal health, um, make sure that you please contact your primary care provider. I also want to mention that uh, Nebraska Medicine, specifically Dr. Cockett, uh, has some wonderful videos out there for March 6th and March 19th, and so we'll make sure to put a link uh, for those wonderful resources from our health system partner. So first off, let's start with a bit of background. Novel coronavirus, corona, COVID-19, what is it? Yes, what is all of that? Uh, well, first of all, a little background. Uh, n a novel coronavirus basically means it's a coronavirus and we don't know what it is. And that's what experts were calling it at the very beginning. So let's backtrack a little bit and talk about coronaviruses in general. Number one, coronaviruses are viruses. They're not bacteria, so you have to treat them very differently. Uh, I am using this as a visual, but we could pretend this is a coronavirus, and really they are named after uh, the corona of like the sun. They have these little spikes sticking out, and uh, they also have a, an envelope, a very particular kind of fragile envelope that they need to infect new cells. And on that note, like all viruses, they have to use specific uh, landing gear to attach to our cell and then they enter our cell and take over our cells and once they get into our cell our cell has to make more viruses uh, the viruses will dictate how that is done they use our cells resources they take over our cells and then they leave and go to other cells maybe in your body or in someone else's body now uh, coronavirus uh, the coronaviruses you should know uh, it's a big family. If something has fur or feathers, it probably has its own unique little coronaviruses. Even humans have coronaviruses, in fact. Uh, you and I might have had a coronavirus in the past, but we thought, ah, oh, this kind of feels like an achy flu kind of thing, but it might have been a coronavirus. And so they're very, very common. Even whales get coronaviruses. The problem occurs is when they jump from an animal to a human host. That's when we get things like pandemics. This first came to our attention in 2003 with SARS. Now SARS, which was a severe acute respiratory syndrome, and then if you add coronavirus, you have the name of the virus. So we would say the first one would have been SARS-CoV. Now, this one uh, actually transferred from uh, civet cats to, or bats to humans, and that caused a big pandemic. Some, uh, some viewers might remember this from 2003. It was a very long time ago. It did get all the way to North America, but it was primarily stopped in Canada. Uh, the next coronavirus epidemic. It didn't get to pandemic, but that was MERS, and that began in the Middle East, and MERS stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Sy uh, Syndrome. Uh, it started in Jordan, and it was transmitted from camels, so a camel coronavirus got into humans, and we're still seeing some cases of those, but it did not get to be pandemic. Now, the name of the virus that we have right now, we have been able to identify it. So instead of calling it a novel, like we're not sure what it is, novel coronavirus, uh, we know now it's a SARS. So think of it as SARS part two, or uh, basically we could call it SARS coronavirus uh, version 2.0. 
Now again, SARS, what is SARS? SARS is severe acute respiratory syndrome. And that refers to the end stage pneumonia that people get. So the disease, the disease, we could call it SARS, we could also call it COVID-19, which is coronavirus disease. And then the 19 just means that it first appeared in 2019. Excellent. So that's a good explanation of the virus, but who is at risk for contracting this? Thank you, Michael. And that's what everyone has been asking. What we're finding out from evidence from China um, and also from Europe, like Italy, and even from our major states like California and New York City, uh, New York that has been experiencing mm -hmm. a lot of cases, um, we know that no one is immune. Uh, hopefully, eventually, we all will be immune, or most of us will, hopefully by vaccines one day. But, um, but right now, everyone is potentially susceptible, as far as we know. But it is true that there are certain age groups that are more at risk. So if you are over 60 years of age, uh, we know the older you are, the higher the risk. Also, if you have some chronic um, severe diseases, then you are more at risk. So if you have cardiovascular disease, if you have diabetes, um, if you have any pulmonary disease, uh, uh, or even, even if you have cancer, you are more at risk. Excellent. So you described this as a respiratory illness. Other than mm -hmm. a, a cough, what are the symptoms of this COVID-19? Again, a good question, and the answer to that is evolving quite a lot. But uh, I will start with what most people know is when uh, you know, we're, we're looking for symptoms in the lower respiratory tract, for sure. So if you have uh, like a lower chest cough and maybe tightness in your chest, it's a little difficult for you to breathe, a non-productive cough. <laughs> okay, so nothing's coming up when you're coughing. A fever, fevers are typical with viruses. Um, that, that's what we think of when we think of the COVID-19 uh, disease. But I will also tell you, and there's more and more evidence that this is true, uh, people can be, uh, can be positive for SARS-CoV-2 and not know it. And they could, and we're reasonably sure they could probably transmit it without even feeling bad. So right now I feel great, but you know I you know I don't know for sure that I'm not transmitting uh, this particular virus. I don't know for sure. So I'm going to treat the whole situation with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have our social CDC distancing there, absolutely, and uh, we just we just want to be careful because we're reasonably sure there's a lot of people out there carrying this virus that are infectious, but they don't know it. So they might have very mild respiratory symptoms. One thing that is also coming up in the literature is that we think perhaps it might be also shed in the fecal material. So basically, in the stool. <laughs> boom, boom. But seriously, you have to be careful with fecal oral transmission. Uh, when you're flushing the toilet, there's such a thing as a toilet sneeze. When you flush, particles become aerosolized, and in that uh, particular circumstance, you could inhale particles of the virus. Now, we saw this with SARS version 1, okay, SARS-CoV-1. We know that there was some transmission through uh, fecal matter in the sewers. We weren't sure about this, but it makes sense that it could happen because the virus, again, it needs certain receptors on our cells to get in. Our respiratory tract and our GI tract have the exact same kind of receptor. So it makes sense that this could happen. But stay tuned for more information because more is coming in every single day. So another question is, how can I protect myself or protect my family from getting COVID-19? And isn't that a very, very important question? And really the answer is elementary, maybe a little oversimplified, but clearly just don't get the virus. The information keeps changing on a daily basis. We're still trying to understand the nature uh, of this particular virus. So 
you know, it's a, it's uncomfortable. We have to change what we do on a daily basis. It, 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 and can we agree that it's okay to feel strange, to feel a little silly? We're thrown into elbow a situ- elbow bump. Yes, indeed, foot bump. Um, we're thrown into a situation that isn't normal, and our response has to be a little uh, abnormal as well. So we have to agree to protect ourselves and our families, our friends are, you know, just the people in our community, we have to change what we do. Mm-hmm. For example, I will tell you uh, something that happened a few days ago. I was at the grocery store and a very nice, very kind young man was talking to me and he wanted to engage me. So he came very close. He invaded that six foot social distancing uh, space that we want to keep. So he walked up, I walked back, he took a step forward, I took a step back, he took a step forward, I took a step back. Hey, we were dancing. But really, and he was just trying to be human and trying to engage. But we have to be rather firm about how we protect ourselves. And we need to feel that it's okay. We have to be okay with this. This is a new norm until, you know, things kind of go back to how they used to be. Um, But one of the things I wanted to mention is what do we do when we have groceries or we have packages that are left outside? What do we do? Well, again, those groceries could have been touched by people. Uh, Packages are delivered by hand. So there are certain things that we can do to protect ourselves when anything comes into the household. Okay. So there was a study that, uh, and the CDC tends to agree with this, that the virus lasts about 72 hours on surfaces. Now I will let you know though there is another study that I will bring up that looks at 22 coronavirus studies, other studies, and they say possibly the coronavirus can last to nine days, which is a lot. But so but we're just gonna we're gonna play it safe. So one of the things you can do is set up a, a kind of a cleaning station. Have one area that's a little dirty, one area that's clean. Mm -hmm. When you bring your grocery, well, when you're in the grocery store and they're asking uh, plastic or paper, from what we understand, uh, paper being more porous will break down the cell membrane a little faster. So your answer should be paper. Paper is going to be preferable. So again, I would have this dirty station. Um, Now you can glove up, but most people aren't going to have gloves or need it for this. Uh, If I have something in plastic, I can just dump this out into my clean zone. Okay, I can just dump this out and then throw this away. You might be able to do the same with your paper towels, okay? Um, Or let's say you're going to store these, wipe these down. Get uh, maybe an alcohol wipe or something like that, wipe it down. If it is a paper product, if it's a paper product that you don't need immediately, set it out for 72 hours. Once again, that other study does mention that in some circumstances, maybe the coronavirus might last for nine days. I'm just putting that out there. It might come up again. But that same study, which really was looking at how to control the coronavirus in the hospital, also recommended certain cleaners. Okay, so what to do? Um, before, Before I even get into cleaners to clean up the kitchen and the counters, once again, wash your hands, soap and water. Okay, anyone coming into the house, um, soap and water. Uh, And even though the recommendation is to wash for a minimum of 20 seconds, uh, really probably 40 seconds is better. And there are several videos, even one put out by Nebraska Med Mm -hmm. I saw, that does a really good job, you know, take off your rings, do a really good, thorough job, 40 seconds, okay? Uh, Pump soap is going to be a little better than bar soap as far as, you know, keeping things clean. Uh, But make sure that you kind of clean off the pump container as well. Now that uh, particular study, and we can, and I'll have that in the, one of the links, recommends certain cleaners. So number one, oh, before we go into that, um, hand, uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Uh, Anyone who's had one of my classes knows that I'm not fond of this. Uh, Usually, experts will say it's better than nothing. 
just like if you were getting up in the morning and you wanted to swish mouthwash throughout your, your mouth instead of brushing. Clearly that mechanical brushing and flossing is so much better. So uh, use the soap, use the soap and water, 40 seconds. Now that doesn't mean that you couldn't use straight up alcohol, okay? Um, and if you add a um, some kind of wipe to that. That's even better mechanically. Scrubbing's really good. Rubbing alcohol, ethanol, it doesn't leave a residue. It's kind of nice. So you can wipe down plastic groceries and things like that fairly easily. Um, and of course, there are Clorox wipes, but these do not usually have the sodium hypochlorite. So you have to look at the ingredients, what's really in there. Um, for if I'm looking for something serious, what do I use? Well, okay, you can use hydrogen peroxide, but this is pretty strong stuff. This is like when you're looking for the one of the bigger guns. Um, but hydrogen peroxide is a pretty good disinfectant, and that was mentioned also in that particular article. Now, something that I love, and people who know me know that I love this. Um, this is when you want to declare germ warfare. Uh, sodium hypochlorite, uh, Clorox, uh, is an, a very good, good cleaner. And as I mentioned, that this virus could very easily be transmitted through uh, the toilet and the bathroom. So you can use this, but you want to use a lot of caution. Number one, follow the directions. Diluting Clorox bleach or any sodium hypochlorite, you can use any brand name, um, if you add water, it's more effective, okay? Adding water actually makes it more acidic, it's better. So follow the instructions, follow the directions. And this is really serious stuff. So wear gloves, use ventilation, be really careful. Don't wear black clothing around sure. this. This is a bad, bad, bad idea. So in regards to prevention, other than the CDC guidelines that we've talked about on social distancing and uh, really mechanical hand washing, uh, are there other things such as supplements and dietary aids that, that could aid in someone from preventing COVID-19? Absolutely, and there's literature to support that. And number one, of course, you want to stay mentally and physically healthy. If you eat right and exercise, actually, that helps your white blood cells, part of your immunity. It helps them to function properly. One of the things, and there's a lot of literature supporting this, uh, is vitamin D3. Uh, vitamin D3, it's in a lot of literature, and we know that it's an immune modulator, not an immune booster. We don't want to boost our immune response. People with allergies and autoimmune diseases will tell you that's not a good idea. Instead, we want to give our white blood cells what they need to respond appropriately. Like, that's a threat. That is not. So vitamin D3 seems like a pretty good safe bet, okay? Something that we could take as a supplement. But of course, uh, follow directions, consult your uh, primary uh, health care provider in that definitely. Another thing that you could do is to take an amino acid. Now amino acids, as you know, are uh, components of proteins. There are 20 amino acids that make up our proteins. And one amino acid supplement is ca called L-lysine. L is in the, the, the letter, L, yeah. And L-lysine, again, it's an amino acid. Uh, people who have herpes outbreaks are usually told by their uh, their providers to take out, take out lysine to calm it down. But how does that work exactly? Well, it turns out that our little friend, the coronavirus, it, it enters the cell, it grabs on, and there's kind of a, a landing gear that attaches to our cells. It enters our cells, it takes over our cells, and tries to reassemble more viruses. In order to do that, it needs a lot of another amino acid known as arginine. Now, what's the relationship? We have two amino acids here. But, okay, the virus wants arginine. If the virus is reaching for arginine, but it grabs all of that L-lysine, the L-lysine instead, it will, uh, basically, it will be blocked from being able to grab the arginine as a result. Uh, the outside protein uh, 
kind of coating. It's called a capsid. Can't be made. Also, certain vir uh, virus enzymes can't be made as a result. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that you could take. Uh, and that one's out there a lot there I mean, it's very common it's in the literature one that's a little unique also another supplement is known as monolaurin monolaurin uh, it is a supplement that can be extracted from coconut oil now how does this work it turns out monolaurin has a particular activity on enveloped viruses so this wouldn't work on every virus it wouldn't work on the norovirus for example but on an enveloped one yeah okay it should so what it does is the monolaurin will put holes and disrupt the outer membrane of our virus if our virus doesn't have a good solid membrane it can't infect the next cell so monolaurin puts you know puts little holes in this one of the things you should know and I should uh, talk about the last two supplements uh, the L-lysine and the monolaurin it could disrupt your normal microbiota your normal flora the bacteria with the L-lysine it might feed one kind of bacterial organism too much and you might have an overgrowth that might give you constipation some people then just can't tolerate it can't tolerate it or they do for a while and then stop and then go back, but again, consult you know your healthcare provider. Uh, with the monolaurin, the the that puts the holes in here, um, it could not only it may not only go after viral envelopes, but it could go after bacterial outer membranes that some bacteria have, and those bacteria might not be very happy and they might die off, and you might have again some symptoms according to, you know that sure. might occur. Once again consult your primary health care yes. uh, practitioner finally zinc most people know that one uh, zinc is in lozenges uh, got a sore throat gonna get a little zinc in there but what does it do all right remember I said the virus has to attach in order to invade our cells uh, the zinc gets in the way of the attachment uh, there's little landing gear that has to attach to a cell receptor zinc gets in the way of that so the virus can't can't attach so that's why zinc is also used commonly to uh, prevent or at least to help viral diseases once again a lot of zinc can be quite toxic in, in little amounts it's you know as you know again look at the label talk to your primary <laughs> care provider but um, in small amounts it does a pretty good job Excellent. Mm -hmm. good so if I feel like I have been affected or perhaps uh, a family member uh, do I need to get tested? Well, first of all, if you think that you have been exposed, you want to, once again, contact your primary care provider. Um, or you can also uh, talk with uh, the health department. Uh, but know that the tests are very limited. And uh, they're going to have to screen you to make sure that you have uh, the symptoms that, they, that are associated with COVID-19. And keep in mind, if you test negative today, that doesn't mean that you will be negative tomorrow. Another thing to consider, uh, when you see the numbers rising, all these confirmed cases, that can very easily be an indicator that we're testing more people. That typically happens in epidemiology. The more you test, the higher the numbers go. It doesn't mean that we have really more cases, just sure. more diagnosed cases. Exactly. Uh, what if, uh I myself or a family member were diagnosed say with a positive test and that's really important especially as we have a lot of nursing students and they come home to families uh, number one if you really think that you have been exposed you have to self-isolate even from your family members once again call your health care provider another thing is if you are a student you want to contact your director we're keeping track of these things if you are an employee at Clarkson College make sure that you contact HR Excellent. how do you have any advice for how a person would stay well and healthy and, and manage stress in this uneasy time <laughs> oh my isn't that really the big question what to do with this, uh, number one, uh, when you are when you have chronic stress, we know that your B and T lymphocytes, aka white blood cells, aka soldiers that take care of you, 
their activity goes down. So you really do have to do something about it. You, you, you don't want this chronic stress if you can help it. I know now probably people are going to be stressed at being stressed. Don't do that either. But there are certain things that you can do, and I'm no expert by any means, uh, but I, I'll just share what I'm doing. So I, I did sit down and think about what to do. So I ordered a uh, Wii Fit. Um, I thought I could put out the money because I'm saving money on all the fast food I'm not eating anymore. Uh, I'm going for walks. I uh, coordinated with a friend of mine when there's good weather. We're going to, and sorry, that is future. I haven't done it yet. I will. Uh, but we're going to meet in parks. There's no reason why you can't walk through a park, but keep the social distancing up. You know, it's going to be okay. Go for drives. If the family's healthy, get them in the car go for a drive. But when you're filling up your car, um, you know, you'll, you'll probably use plastic. There's probably a keypad. Be ready to wipe down your hands and your credit card. Um, one of the things I've been doing, I should mention this, is I, I keep a credit card in a very safe pocket. Uh, and that way I'm not always dipping into my purse or my wallet or anything like that. I have one designated credit card and just a nice zip little pocket. So that's one of the things that you can certainly do. Excellent. Very uh, excellent tips that you're doing. Thank you. One other question that's come in uh, that we've had lately is any tips for returning to life after this outbreak? That is one of the questions that I get a lot. I think people are really just looking for a ray of hope. Like, what, what is our future? Tell us that it's you know not going to be post-apocalyptic or anything like that. And I will tell you that history has taught us that infectious disease like this burns out. It just eventually, you know, it might burn strong, and then it has nothing else, and then it just settles down. So things will return. I'm reasonably sure. Uh, like if history can teach us anything. But in the meantime, we have to take every day, one day at a time, we have to look at what is most important in our lives and be good and kind and helpful to one another. It's one community. We need to help each other. Excellent words of advice. In with us next, we have Dr. Julie Taylor Costello, our Director of Academic Service Success at Clarkson College. Uh, and uh, share with some tips and resources uh, to help be successful in this time. So welcome. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay, so this is obviously a shift for a lot of students right now. Um, we have a lot of students that were in class that were used to being in class, you're used to being studying in, in larger groups, being in sim lab, going to clinical, and all that looks different now. And we have students that are online that are still feeling the stress or maybe not being able to work. So there's a couple things that I've been reading that are going through all the different higher ed blogs and websites and things like that. One is if students can create some sort of a good workspace for themselves. Sometimes this might be hard. You might have a family. You might have some significant others in your home. You might have children now because they're not in school. Um, pets running around. But the big thing is, is try to find a space that you can set up your computer. Um, make sure that workspace is distraction free, which is really hard right now. Because a lot of people want to be reading the news. They want to be looking at their phone. Everybody's social distancing. So everybody's texting each other or FaceTiming each other. Find a time that you can work uninterrupted in that space. And turn the phone off. Turn the TV off. Turn the radio off. If you have family members, try to say, hey, listen, I just need a couple hours of time just to work on my homework. The other piece of that is if students are not used to being online, they're used to going to class. What I really recommend for our students is to set aside time like they would be in class. They were gonna be in class anyway, so from one to two or from 11 to two o'clock in the afternoon, set aside that time like you would be in class because that will make you focus on the assignments, listen to the lectures. There are a lot of faculty that are still posting lectures right now. Take notes like you would in class. Be actively engaged. It's a little bit harder because students have to put that self-imposed deadline on themselves. And if they don't do that, they're gonna find themselves on a Friday going, oh my goodness, I should have watched that lecture, I should have done that homework, I should have done that assignment. Now I've got five other things I have to do for every other class. So try to find that uninterrupted time where you can just dedicate it to class. So another thing is that we really want our students to keep using our resources. Um, I don't think a lot of under students understand that 
we are still available. We are available online. We're available via the phone. We're all on our email. Anybody who's working from home has access to all of the same resources they would if they were here. So we want students to know that tutoring is being offered. They have to just go to the tutoring website and register via Register Blast. SI is being offered via Canvas. Our counselors are available. Right now they're meeting with students over the phone, possibly over Zoom, but a phone meeting is just as good right now and we know students are feeling really stressed so this is a great time to use our counseling resources. We also have all of our other resources. They All they have to do is give the Success Center a call and we can get them connected with whatever it is they need right now. Sharon mentioned, you had asked Sharon about, you know, what do we do in a time like this and the stress that we're feeling. We really are encouraging students to still stay connected with each other. There's a lot of ways if students have um, smartphones they can FaceTime with each other, they can Skype with each other, they can use their Zoom account through the Office 365. I know that our IT department sent out an email about the Microsoft Teams. So if groups want to get together and meet and maintain the social distancing, they still can do everything that they need to do, just not on campus. The other piece of that too is stress release is crucial in a time like this. A lot of people are living at home, they're trying to do homework, they're trying to balance, they're trying to find time for their kids and their pets and their significant others or even just themselves and they're lonely because they're not used to not seeing their classmates in person every day. So in addition to using our counseling resources and the Success Center resources, they need to find ways to de-stress. And so if they can do that virtual time with their friends or family, that's important. But also looking for other ways, taking walks, watching a good movie, but still staying on top of homework. That procrastination can cause more stress if they don't stay up on top of their studies. And then we, as a, as, as a Success Center team, we are going to be sending out emails on a weekly basis with meditation techniques, or here's just some funny things to pay attention to, to try to get everybody's mind on something else versus just what's kind of monopolizing the news right now. So find ways to definitely be healthy because this can take a toll mentally, physically, emotionally. Excellent. That's some excellent advice both for our students, employees, and the general public. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So thank you for tuning in and watching this video. Our closing advice, whether you're an employee, a student, alumni of Clarkson College, or anyone in the public, we first urge you and everyone to do your part in slowing the spread of the virus and following those CDC guidelines. Be it social distancing, quarantining if you're positive, or just the hand washing, if we all do our part, we can flatten this curve and stem the increasing tide of the infection. Secondly, as a healthcare institution, we would be remiss not to encourage everyone to be fact-based in our decisions and discussions. We call it evidence-based decision-making. Be hesitant with gossip and social media posts. The CDC, Nebraska Medicine, along with the state and local government and health authorities are the true sources of the guidelines and information that we should be following. They will guide us through this time. Finally, know that there are resources out there, be it as a member of the college or in your community, that can help keep you safe and well through this outbreak. Know that hope starts today with planning for tomorrow, and doing our part should give us hope that we can overcome this outbreak and be a stronger and more resilient people. So thank you for tuning in.